Okay, forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, recording in progress. Well, as we begin the day, I, I don't know, I, I was trying to remember as I growing up and we studying Revelation, Revelation didn't come up much. I mean, we had the Old Testament, then we had the New Testament, and the New Testament was Matthew through Jude. And then kind of Revelation was kind of a standalone book. I mean, Revelation was... Third rail. Well, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, the, it was the future, it was the end times, and so very seldom you ever hear any scripture from Revelation. So, in this particular study, Dan's done a real good job of connecting everything together. And this, I mean, and this is what, what we really understand, that Revelation is just like all the other books. I mean, it's all related. Because we, we've been in the Old Testament, we've been in Exodus, Psalms, Zechariah, Daniel, and Isaiah. In the New Testament, we've been in John and Romans and First Corinthians and Galatians. And we're going to be in a couple more books this morning in the New Testament. So, I mean, it's all connected together. An interesting thing about all this is there's it's all about life. I mean, it is for us. And so, as, as we begin this morning, we're going to be in chapter 2. So if anybody want to read chapter 2 of Revelation, verses 1 through 7. Okay. <clears throat> Let me get my throat cleared. <clears throat> to the angel in the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your labor, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate those who are evil, and you have tested and exposed as liars those who falsely claim to be apostles. Without growing weary, you have persevered and endured many things for the sake of my name. But I have this against you. You have abandoned your first love. Therefore, keep in mind how far you have fallen. Repent and perform the deeds you did at first. But if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolotians, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to eat from the tree of life, in the paradise of God. Uh, thank you, Rich. You know, this is, so I'm going to read, that was verse 1 through 7. And if you remember what Rich just read, verse 1. And I'm going to read in chapter 1, the last verse of chapter 1. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So this is what, what we studied before, and Dan, I want to read some things from you from last week. The lampstands. Jesus may ascend and rule from heaven, but he continues to be present with and care for his church. Likewise, he knows the spiritual condition of his church and so can reward or judge accordingly. And then we talk about the churches. Despite the trials the church faced, they continue to be under Jesus' protection and care. Coupled with the sh sharp two-edged sword, which cuts both ways, the power of judgment is in Jesus' hands, both to reward and condemn. So then I read verse 20. It's about the mystery. And I was spent, last week spent a lot of time on the mystery. So this is in Dan's notes. Scripture employs the term mystery to refer to that which we beforehand unknown but has now been made known by divine revelation. The term was frequently used to speak of prophecy being fulfilled, but in unexpected ways. So here we have, you look at the last verse, verse 20 of the first chapter. We're talking about the seven stars being the seven angels of the seven churches. And then you look at the first verse of two, and it says, to the angel of the church of the Ephesus. Right. So we're getting specific now. We had the 
all those seven together, and now we're getting one. We're getting the one angel of the one church. We're studying the seven churches. So this, so you almost say we're starting to unveil the mystery. The mystery is starting to be un unveiled to us. And so as we go forward, there's one thing I want. I'm going to divide this up into three, three sections. So help us to understand. First one is going to be the city of Ephesus. Now the city of Ephesus is pretty important because this is going to, what's going on in Ephesus is influencing the rest of what's going on in Asia Minor. So that'd be the first section. And then we're going to talk about the church in Ephesus and kind of help you to understand what's going on there. And then we're going to get into the third part, their first love, which is verse four. So we want to help us understand this church or the, the church in Ephesus and the city of Ephesus and what was what they were up against. So that's what we want to do. So I'm going to share with you, and this is from different commentators and authors. So this is just basically on the city of Ephesus. So it gives us a good background of the, on the city. So Ephesus was an ancient city port located near the western shores of the modern day Turkey. Back in the day, it was one of the most important Greek cities and the most important trading hub in the Mediterranean. For centuries, the city served as a crossroads between the east and the west, and it was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Now, Ephesus was famous for the Temple of Artemis, or Diana. Now, great crowds were attracted to Ephesus by the cult of Artemis and her famous temple. The Temple of Artemis was considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Now, Artemis is a Greek name, and the Roman name is Diana. So sometimes it's going to be Artemis, sometimes it's going to be Diana. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the interesting thing is because Artemis is kind of a male name, and Diana is a female figure. So the foundation of the temple, um, it was 420 feet long, 220 feet wide, uh, it was twice the size of any other Greek temple, and it had 127 columns, which were 60 feet high and 4 feet in diameter. And it took workers 120 years to finish the temple. In the 4th century BC, a fire destroyed the temple, and worker, workers completely rebuilt the temple twice. So, now the peak times of Ephesus were during the Hellenistic time, or the Roman times, and during the feast days honoring Artemis, the population tripled in Ephesus. In the second century AD, many marble buildings were built and the streets were dedicated with marble statues. Uh, the city had one of the most advanced aqueduct and sewage systems in the ancient world with multiple aqueducts of various sizes to supply different areas of the city, including four major aqueducts. So as, as we go on here, this is um, the temple was made of glist, glittering Persian marble. The temple was a museum, collections from all over the world. It was a sanctuary for criminals. Now, Ephesus is an important city, uh, site in Christianity. Ephesus appears multiple times in the New Testament. The oldest reference to Ephesus in the New Testament is in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now, the ancient city is also the home of a very, the very first church dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Now, this, yeah. Mary, the mother of Jesus, spent her last years in Ephesus, and so did John. John was there, too. In 17 AD, an earthquake destroyed Ephesus. Tiberius, a the second Roman emperor rebuilt and enlarged the city after the earthquake. Workers built the library of Celsus to honor Tiberius. The library was the third largest after Alexandria and Pergamon. It housed between 12,000 and 50,000 scrolls. Situated on the Aegean Sea in the mouth of Keister River, the city was one of the greatest sea ports of the ancient world. Now, three major roads led from the seaport. One road went towards Babylon by Laodicea, which is the seventh 
church in the seven. Another went north to Smyrna, which is the second church of the seven. And the third went to the Meander Valley. Now, it also had a theater. Now, the theater held 25,000 people. It was built by the Hellenistic period, during the Hellenistic period, and was renovated by several Roman empires. Designed for theoretical, uh, theoretical performances, later alterations allowed gladiatorial contests to be held there. So Ephesus, Ephesus being a major port, as was the first on the list of seven cities that formed a circle clockwise into inland Asian Minor. Archaeologists have discovered the remains of the ancient Roman road that stretched from Ephesus to Laodicea, the last of the seven cities. Starting at the great city, which would be Ephesus, the roads were geographically semicircled, connecting all seven cities on what functioned as an ancient postal route. I think Dan has mentioned that before, which I heard had a postal route. Well, yeah, that was their postal route for the seven churches. So we're going back to the temple. The wealthy kept their treasures there in the inner shrine. No one was allowed to violate it, but it was a place of unbelievable graft and confusion chaos. They sold little gods. They sold gods for your neck. This is the first place we find idols put on the front of your chariot. Uh, like a hood ornament? Yeah, that's what I would yeah, that's just, that's Kind of like a hood ornament. <laughs> you want to see the trucks they have over there now? Yeah. That's what they did. Yeah. This is, this is, yeah. The worship of Diana itself was beyond description. There were scores of eunuchs who had been castrated for the purpose of serving their god or goddesses. There were thousands of priestesses who were nothing but prostitutes who believed that in sexual orgies, they could lift up worshipers into the presence of the deities. There were unnumbered heralds, those who proclaimed. There were singers. There were flutists. There were dancers. People doing banking. Criminals trying to find asylum. People trying to look at the museum pieces. Worship going on. Prostitution. Music. Feasts. Festivals. And a whole hysteria became a frenzy and shameless sexual mutilation. Now, there's what's going on in the town. This is not. This is not. Uh, a, huh? This isn't a family friendly. Uh, <laughs> no, no. This is not. I mean, this is why Ephesus. This is the influence of what was going on in Asia Minor and the other. This, it also shows you why Paul wrote what he did to Timothy. Yeah, and we'll get to that now. Yeah. So huddled in the middle of this is a church. And you can understand when the church was born in the middle of all this is why it became a, a very, very significant sore spot and why persecution broke out. The preaching of Jesus Christ by Paul had affected the worship of Diana, affected the idol sales that dropped off seriously so that that participated the riot in Acts 19. Now, this is the beginning of the church of Ephesus. Now, here's the interesting. God gave them Aquila, Priscilla, Apostle, uh, Apollos, Paul, Tychius, Timothy, and John was there as an elder. So the city's chief industry, now this is interesting. This is the chief's, the city's chief industry was the supply of idols to pilgrim worshipers who traveled to Ephesus from all parts of the world to pay homage to the city's great temples, such as Diana. So if you read Acts um, 19, 23, 23 through 27, it talks about um, Super. where they had the little structure, the, the people that are making the ornaments and all that stuff, they got a little upset and they got together and they said, man, Paul's preaching, that's going to ruin the temple. We're going to be out of business. So that cuts the, into their profit. Yeah, that's an axe. So if you want to read that. So any questions on the city of Ephesus? Any any questions on that? That's not that's a nasty town. Yeah. <laughs> and so now we want to go to the church in Ephesus. So now we're gonna some information on the church. 
Okay, now this, now Paul, on the end of his second missionary journey, he stopped by Ephesus for about three months. We'll get into that. But on his third missionary journey, he spent um, maybe two and a half years there. And then he, on another missionary journey, he came back and he asked the elders to come and see him, but he was in another town, and we'll get to that. But, but this is what's interesting about all this. So we'll start here. In the last of his second missionary journey, Paul came to Ephesus with his companion Aquila and Priscilla. Now they were probably across the Aegean Sea and probably maybe Athens is where they were and they were coming back. Now Paul was the one who founded the church at Ephesus, promising his companions that he would come back. He departed Ephesus for Antioch. Less than a year, he stayed in Antioch. He came back to Ephesus in 53 AD. Now, I'm probably going through some dates and times, but don't get too concerned about the dates and times because some of the authors I was referenced to believe that Revelation was written in the 90s, so their dates are different, and there's some that believe it was written before 70 AD. So some of the dates are going to be... So don't get confused about the dates. So... But uh, Paul was back in Ephesus about 58, 53 AD. Now, that's pretty close. It was probably in the mid-50s when Paul was on his third journey, was in Ephesus. It says here he lived in Ephesus over two and a half years. Now, he preached in a school funded by a wealthy Ephesian named uh, Tinerius and in the synagogue of Ephesus. Now, I'm going to read to you. <clears throat> this is from Acts 18. Now, a lot of this is from Scripture. It's, it's all in, in Acts. After this, Paul stayed there many days longer and then took leave of the brothers to sail from Syria for Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila. So they're on the other side of the Aegean Sea and they're coming across. They came to Ephesus and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When, he asked, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on leaving of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. So he was on his way to Antioch. So this is Paul. He made some miracles while he was in Ephesus. He cured the diseased people, either touching them uh, or with the clo cloths he used. Paul was uh, able to earn his own living by selling tents. Now this is interesting. And we've, we've studied this before. Paul learned this profession from his father and grandfather. Both were tent makers of the Royal Roman Army. They were gifted with Roman citizenship. Roman citizenship used to pass through from father to son. Therefore, Paul was also a Roman citizen. Paul's mother was a Jew and father was Greek. So Paul was Jewish and Greek, which made him preach in the synagogue easily and talk with Greeks in the pagan temples of Ephesus. Since he was a Roman citizen, the Greek soldiers were not able to arrest him. Being Roman in Greek cities like Ephesus was like having a first-class citizenship. Now, the church then, to which this letter is addressed is Ephesus, it is one of the seven churches in the province of Asia Minor. Today, you would uh, know it as modern Turkey. The Ephesian church was perhaps the most prominent one since all the other six were founded as daughter churches out of Ephesus. That's why Ephesus is important and what was going on there. <clears throat> now, as he's founded by the extensive ministry and Apostle Paul, which lasted something more than three years. Now, this is a spiritually strong church founded and taught by Apostle Paul and other apostles who followed him. It is probably true that even before Paul did the yeoman work of giving the... Uh, giving form to the church that Aquila and Priscilla, who had been left there by Paul, did some preliminary foundation work. Now that's in Acts 18.21. So they were influenced, they were initially under the influence of Aquila and Priscilla, but they are also influenced by the powerful Old Testament preacher by the name of Apollos. Now he came to Ephesus from Alexandria. So when he got there, the only thing he knew was the baptism of John the Baptist. 
So he didn't yet, didn't yet uh, know about uh, the Messiah of Christ. So Aquila and Priscilla, according to Acts 18, 25 and 26, they taught him more for perfectly the gospel. So, so they had some very strong beginnings and some very powerful and wonderful people. Now, there was a lot of people that went through the Church of Ephesus. Paul uh, not only was there for a period of three years, but he also came back at a later time and was instrumental on the way to Jerusalem, stopping in Miletus and called the elders of the if, uh, Ephesus church to come to him. So, And we're going to get into that. He stopped about 30 miles south of Ephesus and had the elders come to him, and he gave him some final instructions. So Timothy served the church, and, um, and a very well-known person to the Colossians. Tychius served there also. Apostle John. John was probably the elder of the church at Ephesus. <clears throat> that was before he was arrested and exiled 60 miles away uh, from the island of Patmos. So John wrote Revelation, and he was an elder at the church at Ephesus before he was arrested. So this, this church had some powerful influence. Now, the beginnings of the church in terms of identity is, that's all in Acts 19. So I'm going to read to you Acts 19, 8, verse 8 and 10, 8 through 10. Now, and this is interesting to Paul. Now, as he entered the synagogue for three, for three months, spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So Paul's in the synagogue. Now, he's there for three months. Okay. So this is what happened. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took his disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tenarius. So he was in the synagogue, and people started complaining. So he took his disciples and went to uh, a hall, or what we get, and NASB uses the name school, Tenarius. So he continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jew and Greek. So he was there, what historians say, he was probably there during what they call the afternoon break from maybe 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon is when he was preaching. Now, the church was born in an unbelievable time, miracles, powerful preaching, the word spread, other churches were founded, people turning from idols, turning from their occult, magic, evil practices, burning their magic books at a tremendous price, putting the idol makers who made the silver gods out of business, creating a riot in the city, which the union of idol workers found out about. So that, yeah. Politically, it was a free city. That it was self-governing. Rome gave Ephesus the right of self-governing. No Roman... No Roman troops were stationed there at all. Great games uh, were conducted there. The Ephesian games, they were rivaled by the Olympic games. Some writers say the whole pageant of Greco-Roman life could be seen in its most brilliant colors in the city of Ephesus. Athletic contest drama. So this is from Adam Hamilton, and Rich knows Adam Hamilton. He, <laughs> Adam Hamilton, he wrote a book called The Call, which is the uh, missionary journeys of uh, Paul. And this is what he writes. It appears that while Paul was in Ephesus, he was monitoring others and then sending them out to take the gospel across the province of Asia and beyond. Priscilla and Aquila were sent to Rome at some point during Paul's time in Ephesus. Timothy and Titus, who were with Paul at various times in Ephesus, were sent by Paul to Corinth and elsewhere to strengthen new communities of faith. So there you have the church of Ephesus. So any questions on the church of Ephesus? Any questions? So now, <clears throat> David? Yeah. Not really on the church of Ephesus, but I didn't know that about Paul, that his father yeah, I didn't uh, was not a Jew. But I find that interesting because I always wondered how he had Roman citizenship when a good Jew would not want to be yeah, associated I mean, with the Romans. And it's kind of a mixed marriage. It, it, well, it was a, it's a lot like um, yeah. um, 
uh, his protege, um, Timothy. Timothy. Yeah. And yeah. the other thing that jumps out is how did being a Jew pass to the next generation? Yeah. Through the well, mother. Yeah. And it wasn't through the father, it was through the mother. Right. Yeah. So I, I find that it's interesting how God made that work. Yeah, he got the Roman citizenship he, through his, his father. father. Yeah. 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 So that brings us to one verse in particular. And <clears throat> When I was going through this, when Dan asked me to fill in for him, this is about three weeks ago, and he says, well, you got your choice. You can either come up with something on your own or you can continue on Revelation. And I asked him, I says, well, where are you going to be? <laughs> so he says, yeah, he says, well, maybe we'll be in chapter two. <laughs> so I went home. Dan's a big talker. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so, I went, so I went home and I read chapter two. And I got to verse four and God put on my heart, you're staying in Revelation. Because what we're going to do is verse four. I'm going to read it to you again from two different versions. So the ESV in verse four. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So that's the ESV. So here's the NASV. But I have this against you, that you left your first love. So the ESV uses the word abandon, and the NESV uses the verse left. Now, so I have one question for you. Now, I want you to answer this in one or two words, and then we'll get back to it later. So in one or two words, what one or two words with this group? Huh? You're saying one or two words with this group? Yeah, I, I want this one. That's why I have mentioned One or two words. <laughs> what was their first love that God said they lost? Love of him. Yeah. Love of him. Love of him. That's what. Mm -hmm. Any other? That was three words. Amazing. Well, that's okay. That's, that's... Sorry. Not... Christ. Okay. Any other? What was their first love? Jesus. Everybody's in agreement? Yeah. Okay. Keep that thought in your mind. Well, so, according to this translation with the Living Bible, it says you've lost love of me and each other. Yeah, yeah we're going to get to that. We're, we're going to come back <laughs> to that. I was just kind of setting the stage. Yeah, I, but, but, yeah, we're, yeah we're going to get back to that. Uh, so I got another question. We want to spend some time in here. So keep that in mind, what you think their first love was. So the next question is, what caused them to abandon their first love? What happened in the church? I'm guessing they let the world in. Yeah. I mean, the, the temple probably started influencing them. Yeah. Just like we let today's world into our life. Compromisers. Well, let's, let's read. Uh, somebody want to look at Acts 20. And we're going to read. I'll tell you what. Verses we're going to read there. Acts 20, verses 28 through 32. Somebody want to read that? I got it. Okay. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So he's warning them. So there's another scripture we're going to read, and that's 1 Timothy 1, 1 through 11. So somebody wants to 
look that up. And First Timothy, and this is where Paul is writing to Timothy, and it's a warning against false teachers, is what what that's about. So First Timothy, First Timothy one one through eleven. <clears throat> Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge, urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrine any longer, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they say confidently affirm. We know that the law is good if one uses it, uses it properly. We also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and ill-religious. For those who kill their fathers or mothers or murderers, for the sexual immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me. Yeah, and this, and, and I want to read to you when we talk to you about Paul was going to call the elders, this this is what Paul, he was, um, this is in Acts 20 also, he went down to uh, Miletus, which is about 30 miles south of Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church to come to him. And this is what he had to say. Did we already read that? It, it's really similar to what, so Paul, with the part of Acts 20, the is it, this is Acts 20, yeah. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the plot yeah. in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained by his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will be come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not sleep night and day to admonish everyone with tears, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So what were you saying earlier, Doretta, about why did they, what happened to the church? They, they were influenced by the world around them by what was happening at the temple of Artemis. And yeah. that, that drew them away from their first love. That, yeah, you know. Yeah, that's way. Such a warning to us oh, today. It is a warning to us. And this is what's so important about this church of Ephesus and probably about the seven churches that we're going to be studying. Yes. Because it's a good good study for us today. Yep. There's no difference between those churches and what's going on today. That's, <clears throat> so, that's why history is so important. We're supposed to learn from it, yeah. and yet we don't. Yeah. Amen. Jeremiah 2.2 2 reads this. This is the Lord speaking to Jeremiah, though. This is kind of the odd turnaround. Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals, you're following after me in the wilderness to a land not sown. Seems like they've forgotten that. Yeah. So do you have something, Wayne? Yeah. I didn't respond with the first question about first love. Oh, okay. <clears throat> the first love was the gospel. 
Yeah, we'll get back to them. Okay, I mean, that, that's bottom line. But these folks are living in a very sophisticated society. They're out every day mingling with people, <laughs> listening to other people's ideas, uh, absorbing, getting to a point where they want to, what's the word I want you to, uh, impress people because they have so much knowledge about Jesus and about the gospel and they're willing to listen to anybody who comes up with an idea to build their esteem instead of trusting in the gospel they started trusting in other people they started listening to everybody that has a nit to pick or yeah. a whim to soothe yeah, they, well, <laughs> you're, you're saying their ears are tickling? <laughs> yes. Well, That's one of my favorite lines in the Bible. You know, I ran across, across this, and I don't know, did anybody know the Rich Renner Ministries? Have you ever heard of that? Oh, Rickenshire. Huh? No. no. He and his family, he's in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, I think is where he's out of. Anyway, he went to, um, some of the commentaries are from him. He and his family moved to, when Russia, Soviet Union broke up, he moved his family to Moscow, Russia. He started a church over there, Great News Church, and they got about 3,000 members at this point. He's got a church in Kiev. Uh, it's about 1,200 members. But but this, going back to what Doretta was saying, here, here's, this is really good, what happens to this is a good news for us. Well, good news for us. It's an indication of these churches, what's going on with these seven churches for us today, because it's no different. So it, it seems that after fighting spiritual battles year after year, testing false apostles, training leaders, starting new churches, overseeing entire groups of churches, and dealing with spiritual wolves who are constantly trying to ravage their ministry, base of the Ephesian congregation became so focused, and this is this is interesting, on protecting their church that they were no longer able to enjoy their relationship with Jesus. They were protecting what they had from the outside. And for the many and they had lost their spiritual fervency. You know, and now it's well there's Vic. That's <laughs> nice of you to know this matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wouldn't miss this for anything. <laughs> Better like I got to come on the clock. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, this is why Jesus was so upset about them. I mean, so you think about that the battles year after year, the toll that takes on you, the false apostles. And this is what Jesus, uh, God warns them of. Training leaders, starting new churches, they were just flat wore out. Mm -hmm. They had wore out and lost their relationship. So I'm going to share something with you from um, Sam Storm. Now, Sam. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, she asked me if I knew who he was. I heard Yeah. This is, we're getting back to the, how they lost their first love. So we're going to get into that. Right. Okay. Now this is from Sam Storm. And you said it was a love of Christ. And, and, and we listen to Dan and we study scriptures. And Dan always says, use scripture to, to explain scripture. Mm -hmm. So this is from Sam Storm. He did a real good job. So everyone is familiar with the indication Jesus brings up against the church of Ephesus considering their fast fading love. I have this against you, said Jesus, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. There is, no, there is no agreement among scholars of Revelation as to what love the Ephesian has abandoned. So you get several indications. Now, some authors say Christ was their first love. Some say it was brotherly love that they lost, which is Amanda, had, Amanda said. And then some of them say it's both. Mm -hmm. So this is what Sam Storm says. The answer depends on, in part, on how one understands and translates the word first. 
Does it mean first in terms of time or chronology? This is the view embraced by the ESV. As they render it, you have abandoned the love you had at first. The idea would be that this is a love they experience immediately after the conversion during the early days of their Christian life. Although the ESV rendering doesn't require it, the implication would be that the love they had abandoned was brotherly love, not the love, the love for other Christians in the church. Others argue that this love was first in the sense that it is the most important love that anyone can experience. That is to say, it is the primary love of the Lord Jesus Christ that comes from before and takes the precedence all over other loves in terms of value. This love is suggested by the NASB, which translates, you have left your first love. Surely, if the emphasis is on that love, which is a preeminent importance, that love, which must be pursued above all others, it's the love of Jesus himself. In the epistle of the Ephesians, written some 30 years earlier, Paul mentioned the fervency of the love of one another and concluded the letter with a blessing of those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. But now, these many years later, the zeal and passion has diminished. But which love had they now lost? Love for one another or love for Jesus? Or perhaps love for both? There are two contextual clues that may suggest the reference is primarily, but not exclusively, to brotherly love. First, how can it be that they abandoned their love for Christ if in immediately proceeding in verse 3, 4 verse 4, Christ himself commends them for enduring patiently for his namesakes? The latter word implies, if not required, the devotion and affection and love for Jesus that would inspire them to suffer for the sake of promoting and praising his name. If they didn't fervently love Jesus, they wouldn't have endured patiently for his namesakes. And if their endurance wasn't motivated by this affection, Jesus would hardly have commended them for it. A second clue comes from which follows in verse 5. There, as a repentant antidote, antidote, so to speak, to their diminished love, Jesus commands them to do the works you did at first. This would more likely suggest that they lost their love was love for one another that can be rekindled by deeds of kindness and compassion and self-sacrifice. On the other hand, I'm not certain we have to choose between the two. Jesus may have well have had both in view. That the decrease in love for Christ issue is a loss of love for our fellow Christians is self-evident. In other words, I think Jesus could easily have said to the Ephesians, how dare you claim to love me at the same time you close your heart to your brother or sister in the body? And when you do love one another, you demonstrate how much you love me. This is confirmed by what we read in Ephesians 6.10. There, the author declares that they have shown love for God's name and serving the saints. What we see in the Church of Ephesus, therefore, was how their desire for orthodoxy and the exclusion of air had created a climate suspicious and mistrust in which brotherly love could no longer flourish. Their eager pursuit of truth had some degree of sour and affections for one another. It's one thing not to bear with those who are evil, but it's another thing altogether when the intolerance carries over to a relationship with other Christian-loving Christians. Our Lord does not leave Ephesians with their problem without a solution. Note the three terse commands in verse 5. Before doing so, however, observe what he does not recommend. He does not suggest that they become theological lax tolerant of error, or indifferent toward truth. 
In other words, don't try to cure one problem in a way that will create another. So then, here's this counsel. First, remember from where you have fallen. Here their love is pictured as the height from which they have descended. To remember is to reflect and meditate on the peak of brotherly affection that they once enjoyed. Recall the former fervor and let the memory of its joys and satisfaction stir you against the mutual devotion. Second, repent. Simply put, stop, then start. Stop the cold-hearted disregard for one another and for Jesus and start cultivating that of affection you formerly had. Third, do. In practice, do the works you did at first. Now, the coming of Jesus in verse 5 is not the second advent at the end of the history, but an advent, however, is uh, it's probably the one on discipline. That's in verse 5. So it's not the end. So, I want somebody to look up Mark 12, 28 through 31. I've got John 13, 34, 35. You got what? Don, Don, Don. 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 I want Mark 12. I want Mark 12. <laughs> 28 through 31. <clears throat> I got John 13, too. <laughs> you got and Genesis 1, 1. I've got Mark 12, 28 through 31. I'm, now, all I want you to do is I'm told, David, I want you to note that. Right. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Now, one of the scribes had come up and heard their debate. Noticing how well Jesus had answered them, he asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, this is the most important. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Right, teacher, said the scribe. You have stated correctly that God is one and there is no other but him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself, which is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. By the way, at this point, I would like to say David and I did not collude today on our messages. <laughs> this is part of your message? Not, something very similar to what I just read here. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this, so we're talking about what was their first love. Yeah. No. I, I, like, I like what Wayne said, the gospel. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, um, go ahead. In 1 John, verse 7, 8, and 9, yeah, it, that was, it implies would that. Would you read that? If you got, yes. that was my second scripture yes. we're going to. 1 John 4, 7 through 11. It implies that uh, yeah. both loves are together and yeah. that oh all right i'll read it yeah I'll love read. it let us love one another for love is from god and whoever loves has been born of god and knows god anyone who does not love does not know god because god is love yeah. in this the love of god is was made manifest among us that god sent his son into the world so that we might live through him so i i agree with um, Amanda, about the brotherly love and God's love being both of them together. Read verse that same. The next, the next right, 110. 20 and read verse 20 and 21 okay. of John, 1 John 4. 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Yeah. So I think you can't separate the two. You can't separate it. And I'm not saying that with John 13. It's saying the same thing. <laughs> yeah. So if you've lost your first love, you've lost them together. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so when you look at Revelations, you go from verse 3, 4, and 5, God had in mind both both loves. Mm -hmm. He described both of them right there. Their first right. their first love. Can't separate them. Right. You gonna say something? Uh, yeah, one second, here. 
I need to work on something here real quick. Um, the word that John uses when he talks about love yeah. and the word that Jesus uses when he talks about them losing their first love is agape. Yes. And it's not, it's not, it's not a goofy, no. fuzzy, I want to love. It's the love of serve. It's, it's serving and doing what God demands of you, whether you feel like it or not. That's a good point, because if you look at, in verse 4, the, the love is in there. Uh, the word love, it's a Greek word for agape. That's agape love. Yeah. So the, the original Greek literally states, because you're love, the first one you have left. Now the phrase, the first one, is a clarification of what type of love Jesus was describing. So the phrase comes from the Greek word ten pro ten, which modifies agape to mean first love or early love. Yeah, I mean this this is <laughs> again I, I like what's yeah. point about the gospel because yeah, yeah. I think it's, that's a nice one word summation of, of yeah of what Jesus said are the greatest commandments. Yeah. It it sounds like Ephesus have gone into maintenance mode. Yeah. Where they're just focused inwardly on themselves and trying to keep seeing status quo instead of taking the gospel out, which they were commanded to do. And this is, I identify with this because I have to keep myself out of maintenance mode. And um, I think, I almost think it's a challenge the longer you're saved to stay saved, if that makes sense. Stay saved. Yeah. If you, I mean, to be hated. what I mean by that is well, sanctification. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not talking about um, losing your salvation, but acting like you're saved. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. To be hated. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's, uh, well, you're, you're describing the about acting like Ephesian, Ephesian, Ephesian church? Yes. I mean, I that's, that's, that's yeah. I think people yeah. that are yeah. that have a long yeah. salvation. Yeah. Sanctification gets to be <coughs> more difficult. Well, is it we, we get wore out? I mean, we, yes. get, we get, yeah. But that's why we show up every Sunday to get refilled. Absolutely. We, we and that's, doing that. that's why we gather as a group, why we come together as a community to fill fill our tanks back up. Because we do get we get wore out yeah. in, in of everything that's going on in in our life. You know, all you have to do is sit down and watch one newscast. Yeah, and just go. Yeah, why am I wasting my time? I know. Well, and, and this but you're not. And, and you think of Paul of all the people that went through the Church of Ephesus. That you're, I mean, look at the yeah. leaders that they had there at that church. And they lost their first love. Uh -huh. And yet Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, which was to the church of Ephesus. Yep. I mean, I mean, the letters that they received. And I was just gonna say to, to your point, I think it is important for us as believers to keep that testimony fresh. Yes. I think that's the thing that keeps us going is being encouraged yeah. from one another, hearing about the ways that God has worked in individual lives and I, I think that's one of the tricks these days is that we see the news we sure. see what's being said on a larger grander scale but we miss the ways that god is still working in individual lives because yep. we're not showing that as much and so it's easy for us to get maybe disillusioned with the fight that we're in and what we're up against and then we forget we lose track of who it is that we serve Right. Yeah. How big and great he is and and how in charge he is of all things. Uh, how many parables and stories did Jesus tell about the importance of the one? Yes. And that's that's the thing that we lose track yeah. of is we you know we want butts and seats. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll share with you this this is some writings from Paul. This is from the book of Ephesians. And when he was writing to them. Now, 
if you look in the Ephesians, now chapter 2, Paul writes about being made alive in Christ. But I think this is this is from chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. This is prayer for spiritual strength. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, which is the breadth and length and the height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I mean, that is, <clears throat> Paul is praying. If you want to use a prayer for somebody, you can use Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. That's a, a good prayer. So <clears throat> I'll close with this. Mark of a true Christian. This is from Romans. Yeah. See, we're all over the New Testament. <laughs> this is from Romans 12, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> the mark of a true Christian. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Mm -hmm. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not make slothful in zeal, but fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Oh. What's your first reference again? Romans 12, 9 through 13. <clears throat> any questions or any comments or anything before we close up? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Ephesus is an important church because that's where all the other churches were founded out of. So, I mean, this, this is really the basis of the seven churches as we go forward. So, anyone like to close us in prayer? Thank you, Rick. God, you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we praise you and we thank you for this study today and for David's efforts. Father, we are constantly amazed by your word. We are amazed at how it holds together and yet how it separates us from the world. Father, we ask that you send your spirit upon us, send your spirit upon the service today. And Father, help us to rekindle our first love. Help us to understand what it means to share the gospel and to do it willingly. And Father, above all else, we thank you for the gift of your son upon the cross who raised from the dead to secure our salvation, Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.